Well, for our text today, I'm going to read a few. I'm going to start with Ezekiel. <clears throat> Just want to read Ezekiel 20, or 36, 26, and 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And then <clears throat> we have uh, in 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, just a great text, 1 Peter, um, 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded, self-controlled, so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Excuse me. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And then uh, our, our uh, gospel text, our main focus today is on John. It's John 15 at the end and then into 16 a little bit. So John 15, 26 says, When the counselor or the comforter comes, whom I will send, this is Jesus talking now, whom I will send to you from the Father, <clears throat> The Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have uh, been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you, so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. Let me read that again. It's pretty harsh. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They'll do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. This ends our reading. First, a little bit about prophecy. Um, there's some hints in Ezekiel. Uh, there's uh, obviously some hints today in our text that has multiple fulfillments. And we see that in prophetic language all the way through the scriptures. Often one prophecy uh, gets uh, fulfilled at a certain time, space, and history. Often it was something happening within or to or from Israel. And then that same spoken prophecy also gets fulfilled at a future time, which is uh, probably the most common was in the time of Christ when he was here. So, uh, in fact, all, all the prophecies ultimately end up in Christ, but, but the literal fulfillment in time, space, and history, sometimes it, there's multiple places. Uh, we were taught this way, that prophecy is like driving into the mountains. When you're far enough away from it, it looks like one mountain and then you get closer and you realize, whoa, there's that mountain, but then there's another mountain behind it. All a part of the same unscrolling, uh, unveiling prophecy. So um, having said that, I want to also read a couple other scriptures to complement our text today. Some of them you're probably familiar with. Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew 24, I'm going to read four verses, nine through 13, five verses. And uh, Matthew 24, beginning with verse 9. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. Again, Jesus talking here. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Remember that part that Jesus said, many will turn away from their faith. In our text today, we hear a little bit of that. 
And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's the good news amongst, amongst the bad. Okay, so then we go to Luke 21. And I'm just going to read one verse. That is verse 11, Luke 21, verse 11. It says, There will be great earthquakes, famines, and various pestilences. So, um, and these are fearful events and great signs from heaven. Um, <clears throat> now, as we dive in back to our John 15 text, now it starts right off by saying Jesus is going to send the uh, comforter or counselor or helper. All those words work uh, with this word paraclete. But the word comforter, uh, for one thing, it's not, um, it's not like the comforter, you know, it's not snuggling up in your comforter in your bed at night. No, it's, uh, it's a word that means coming alongside to help. So, many hands makes light work, right? You've heard that phrase, or many hands makes fast work. When we come alongside of each other, if you see somebody has a need and you come alongside them and help them out, isn't that just a refreshing thing? Well, Jesus says he's going to send the Holy Spirit to you, to us, those who believe in Jesus Christ, who are called his children. That's one of the great benefits of being a Christian is we get the Holy Spirit to come alongside us. Parakletos or paraclete or helper. Comfort. That's the type of comfort that we will get. This prophecy obviously uh, is pointing immediately to uh, the time of the apostles right after Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, and it certainly did happen. Um, so, uh, but it's also, uh, and I'm sorry, I got mixed up there. I, I'm referring to the, uh, the next verse, which says, um, Okay, where are we at here? Got to get on the right page. That would help. Um, all this I've told you so that you will not go, go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. So that, that did happen after Jesus' time on the cross. But, but uh, the sending of the Holy Spirit, that, is, uh, that was, of course... The big event we call Pentecost, which the book of Acts is all about that. So, um, again, we're talking about fulfillment of prophecy, time, space, and history. And guess what? There's more to come because Jesus is coming again. And uh, as we read, some of those signs of Jesus coming involve these sorts of things. And I read the Matthew text specifically because it mentions a variety or various pestilence. And so I think this is a good time for us as a church to look up, to look, to G look for Jesus. Uh, I, I think, you know, every generation has reasons to look for Jesus to come in their, in their generation. And um, we don't know which generation that will be, but it certainly very well could be that we are close to the end times, that we are close or in the last days, that we may see Jesus return in our lifetime. Do you believe that? Do you believe that that could happen and that can happen and that believing it, there's no shame in that. And in fact, the Lord encourages us to believe that. When we see these things happen, he directly says, keep watch, stay alert, be ready. Those are the types of phrases that the Bible uses that Jesus himself says when you see these things. So when you, when you see a pestilence like, oh, I don't know, a pandemic, look for Jesus. Jesus wants us to keep watch, to be ready. So um, it's a good thing. Why? Because we have something on the other side. It's something that's available to everybody. It's not a secret. It's not something we hold on to. We, we don't hoard it for ourselves. It's to be shared. It's to be given freely. It's the good news of the gospel. It's Jesus Christ. It's all about that first coming. You see, when he died on the cross, 
when Jesus came and he, he hung there for, for the world and he put the sin of the world upon himself and he suffered the punishment and he conquered death in the grave. He uh, conquered the devil by rising again. And so Jesus now tells us, just as he told the, the uh, disciples, <clears throat> I'm sending somebody to you. And yes, that historical event happened. The Holy Spirit came and you can read about it in the beginning of the book of Acts. But you know what? He's still sending the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is still coming. You see, it's a perpetual uh, event, uh, process of events. Um, because the Holy Spirit resides in us now. <clears throat> if you believe in Jesus Christ, guess where the Holy Spirit lives? In you. It's not like the old covenant when you had to go to the temple uh, externally to have your sins forgiven. Now, now the uh, Holy Spirit is, is it's, uh, inside us. It's inside job. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is really exciting. So if you, I'm going to give you a little peek in the next chapter because there's something I want to, I want to address this comforter business. And the, <clears throat> the three things that John 16, now we just started into 16, but the whole chapter talks about three things that the Holy Spirit does as it's comforting us. And these might not all sound real comfortable, okay? Because coming alongside is not always comfortable for us. But he gives us the truth, okay? That's his main role, to guide us into truth and to convict us of sin. Now, I want to I park on that a little bit. What does convicting us of sin have to do with comfort? Okay, well, a lot of people think that if I'm anxious about my sin or as I'm becoming aware of my sin, it's showing up in me that that's a bad thing. And some people even take it as far as to think, I might not be a Christian. I want to tell you. The comfort is this, the opposite is true. When you become aware of your sin, that's a good thing. And while it may temporarily produce uh, anxiety, um, ultimately there's a place that you can bring the sin. That's to the foot of the cross, it's to Jesus Christ, because that's already been paid for and he's your advocate before the Father. Uh, there's just, it's like a whole system's already in place for you. But um, just because you are convicted of sin doesn't mean you're not a Christian, doesn't mean you're not living right. In fact, it's probably a sign that the Holy Spirit is actually in you and you can take comfort in that. Why? Because he is helping you. Remember, we're not talking about snuggling in a comforter to go to sleep. Uh, now, towards the end of our physical life, I think that that, that type of thing may happen. But... There's just a whole lot of journey going on in a tear-filled world, in a, a world of suffering, in a world that you know, we already read that because of the, all the, the wickedness in the world, the love of people will grow cold, not warm. And so even living in this world is, you know, many times until the day we die will feel like a, a yucky experience. Uh, along with the good things, we'll always carry something that will involve uh, a fear of something that might happen or not happen, uh, perhaps a regret of something that has happened or didn't happen. Um, we, just, we just live with this because of our own sin and because of a broken, sinful world. Um, as Ken Ham says, we really live in a garbage dump, okay? But the, re the redemption is there. The redemption is here. We don't have to wait for Jesus' second coming to have that redemption. God begins, he has already begun the process because the Holy Spirit is here now. We're not waiting for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's role in you and I is to glorify Jesus. And when that happens, we have a Christianity that takes us above all that. It takes us through all that, around it, under it. It helps us to deal with it. Uh, and even to the point where the disciples themselves, when they ran into the suffering and especially the persecution, they came back and reported to each other what they got to do. They were excited. They rejoiced, the Bible says, because I suffered for Jesus today. And so 
how can you say that unless the Holy Spirit has really done a work of comfort inside of you, who's given you a peace uh, that passes all understanding, as the Bible has says. Um, so uh, now the reason that God wants us to be aware of our sin, by the way, if you have a child or you take care of a child or you're a grandparent of a child who is reaching that stage of puberty, here's what, here's what happens with kids. Because of God's grace, they're not really that aware of their sin. I mean, they are because mom and dad tells them when they're doing right or wrong. But that real spiritual awakening begins to happen around that age. And as they become aware of their sin, that can sometimes be a bit frightening for them. It can, it can, it can, sometimes they can react very strongly to it. And that's a perfect time for you to bring in the gospel, to, to talk about how, yes, that is a sin, but you know what? Uh, Jesus took the punishment for that. So he took care of that for you. And to, to let the gospel go really deep into them so that they, they grow and that's how they get to know who the Father is. The Father is the one who sent his Son, who loves them. And when they, when they come up against the crud of the world, and, you know, we don't even know how this pandemic is affecting the little children yet. We really don't. I think it's going to be a few years when, when we look back and see. Uh, they'll probably handle a lot better than us adults, but at the same time, that's something that we need to pay attention to. So back to glorifying Jesus. When you are glorifying Jesus, when you're... When you're yakking about Jesus, guess what? That means the Holy Spirit is working in you. So if, if, if you're hungering for the truth, if you're feeling that conviction of your sin, by the way, take it to the cross, but if you're feeling that conviction of your sin and you are glorifying Jesus in your words and your actions, guess what? You have the Holy Spirit. He's there. He's in you. He's with you. He's around you. He's ahead of you. He's behind you. He's under you. He's over you. That's what Jesus said is going to happen. So that's the kind of comforter that we have. Remember, the word means to come alongside to help you. So anytime these things are happening, know this, that you are being helped. If you're struggling with the truth of God, the Holy Spirit's going to help you. The Bible even says that when you cannot think of words to pray because maybe your anguish is that deep. The Holy Spirit actually prays for you. Boy, talk about help, huh? If you're feeling that conviction of sin, know that that is to help you. And if you're glorifying Jesus, I just, I always like to say, you know, when you've been with somebody, did, did some Jesus rub off on them, you know? And I, you know, I, I think we, we, the Bible says always be prepared to, to share, to give a, a reason, for, an answer for the reason and for the hope that we have. So uh, that's what's so exciting about the Holy Spirit coming as, as our comforter. Um, so uh, just a slight little turn now I want to take because the text brought it up. It, the text talks about uh, Jesus sending the Holy Spirit and uh, also talks about the Spirit going out from the Father, okay? Now, this gets into the Trinity a little bit, and let's just go ahead and deal with a little bit of doctrine and a little bit of history. Okay, the, the whole church had a schism between the East and the West in about 1000 AD, roughly 1027 to be exact. But in that time period, uh, that's why when you read the Nicene Creed, the longer version, uh, by the way, uh, Caleb and Dealey actually had the Nicene Creed read at their wedding. You don't see that often, but it's much more full and it's longer. But in there, it talks about the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. This is the text. This is the debated text. Believe it or not, the, the early church fathers were so concerned about doctrine, and that's a good thing, by the way, because when we are concerned about doctrine, we help the next generation. Just as they were concerned about doctrine, they, were even, they even divided the East from the West between uh, uh, all over that one particular issue of whether the Holy Spirit um, uh, proceeds from the Father or the Son or both. And of course, uh, us in the West, we embrace both, that the Spirit, and, and this is one of the texts right here. 
uh, because it says, I will send to you. So Jesus is sending, uh, and then it says, from the Father. Okay, and then the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father will testify about me. That's what Jesus is saying. So that's the whole Trinitarian, it's a complementary relationship. Three persons, not three forces. The Holy Spirit's not a force. By the way, that would be an error. That'd be a heresy that's very popular today. I think movies like Star Wars, which I, I, I enjoyed Star Wars, but if we're not careful as Christians, that, that can shape what, what we think of God. And I think, I think uh, a lot of these, uh, uh, war uh, these mighty hero movies, um, I think they pump up that idea of, of a force that we can have and, and we can have this extra power. You know, what, what's your power? Well, the spiritual gifts aren't powers like Superman and, and all these other Spider-Man and all that. No. Uh, but we have to even be careful because we are influenced, uh, even as adults. Uh, so it's three persons. It's not the Father, Son, and the Force. Okay, it is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All persons, but one God. Okay, one God. Not three gods, one God. Okay, so that's, that's our little doctrine today. But I, I hope you can appreciate the Holy Spirit a little bit more today what his role is, and just if you, if you forget, remember one thing. Remember that the Holy Spirit's already here. Jesus predicted it. The Holy Spirit, and by the way, uh, the Holy Spirit is written in a masculine form, so it's okay to say and believe that the Holy Spirit is a he. And so uh, the Holy Spirit is um, uh, here. He's in every believer inside of you. And today's focus is that he is coming alongside of you to help you. Remember the word comforter. Jesus sent him to you. So let's glorify Jesus today. Let's hunger for the truth in every way, but especially through the word of God. And let's think differently when we're convicted about our sin. Let's see, ah, the Holy Spirit's in me. That's good. Maybe I'm really troubled about a current sin, a past sin, a repeated sin, uh, maybe even just a made-up sin. Either way, the Holy Spirit's here to help you. Jesus said, I did not come into this world to condemn you. I came to save you, to bring salvation. The reason that the apostles were put to death and they were put to death by men who thought they were actually doing a service to God. Jesus said it would happen. It happened. It's happening again. We can face that. By the way, it is happening in our world right now. In the name of God, believers, <clears throat> people are being put to death. And, you know, uh, I don't want to be a doomsdayer, but it could get worse for us as well. And we just need to be ready and be prepared and ultimately to know that the Holy Spirit is with us. He's our comforter no matter what happens. But the story doesn't end with persecution. The, the Holy Spirit allows us to say what we didn't believe we could say, to be as strong as we didn't think we had the strength, to um, believe what, what we didn't think we could believe, to hope for what we didn't think we could hope. The Holy Spirit will even pray for us, the Bible says, uh, when we can't even pray for ourselves. So no matter what happens, know that that's not the end of the story. As we have read, the end of the story for us is a life on the other side of the River Jordan, a life in the promised land. And while we're not just hanging on, waiting for that, we are living fully but we are still waiting appreciatively that in the time that we wait for Jesus to come again, we've got the greatest gift, the greatest person, the greatest comforter, the greatest friend um, that we could ever have. What a privilege it is to know the Father. You see, in our text, Jesus wants us to think about this so that we will not go astray. These these wicked people that are killing Christians in the name of God and thinking they're doing a service to him, 
Jesus said in our text, read it, John, go ahead and read John 16, 1 through 4. It is because they do not know the Father. They don't know God. But you do. Let's act like we believe. Let's act like we hope. And let's act like we trust. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, for all the things. Oh, it's just overwhelming sometimes to think about the Holy Spirit. But I thank you, God, that we are privileged to have what you sent from the Father. You are here, and we have no reason to think otherwise, but just to thank you with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.